Welcome to update number eight of the High Def Nest project. This time I have version two boards done and working. I built four and three of them work. The fourth one, I don't know why it doesn't work. I think the FPGA may not have got soldered all the way or whatever, but I'm gonna try and fix it. In any event, in this video, I will show my project here, the what the boards look like, it's operating, and then me assembling four of the boards by hand. So if you want to see how, it, how it's done, I've done that. It's a time lapse, so it, the whole time lapse portion isn't very long, relatively. And it's similar to the layout of the last video. And then I've also got a little tour of my reflow oven and the microscope that I use and some of the other little bits and bobs that make it, make it all work. So in the last video, it's how me design the board. And in this video, you're going to see me stuff the boards. This whole redesign has been kind of a big headache. It has a big face palm to um, the American circuit board manufacturers. I wanted to get the boards done quickly, and I checked out the quick turn prototype circuit board houses in the U.S. And house number three, let's say, I'm not going to name any names, I set them the design. And then they, and it was going to cost like $650 to get six boards made. And they kicked it back after I paid and everything, saying, oh, well, oh, we, we just can't do this. this there's just, the clearances are just too small. So the clearances they wanted were just huge. It's like, you know, the boards in the 90s were laid out with tolerances like this. And it's like they just haven't changed anything in the last 20 some years. And. It was gonna, like I said, it's gonna cost six hundred fifty dollars to have them make three boards now, not six, three boards to my spec was gonna cost nine hundred and eighty freaking dollars. There's no way I'm gonna pay that. So I ended up getting the boards made through a Chinese uh, board house, and it was only about three hundred dollars, and I got them like three days quicker than the American place could have done it. They had to come on a freaking airplane all the way from China to get here. So, hey, hmm, I don't know. I really wanted to give them my money, but they just did not want to take it. In any event, that's, that was the whole problem with the board. So I got the boards made. They came back. They look really nice. They're green this time because the really, really quick turn protos, that's all they come in. I got the boards, bought the parts, got stencils, and put five boards together. I put one board together last week and it mostly worked. I had some problems. The FPGA was crooked and I couldn't fix it. So I'm thinking I'm going to take that chip off and try again. I don't know yet. And then yesterday I built four complete boards. And in this video you'll watch me do that. Here I'll just do a quick little overview of how this new design is actually going to fit. Because I think it looks really nice. Okay, here's the doodad itself. It's running right now, and here's how it works. Here's the, the main board that'll sit underneath the top loader NES board. And then right here, this I'm just powering it through these two quickly. This one's a ground, this one's power. And then here's your HDMI cable snaking away. And then these go to the interposers, and here's the interposer. It sits underneath the CPU and PPU right here. So what it is, it's a little circuit board and it's got pins that you, that you uh, solder on and then it plugs into a socket on the main board and then the chip plugs into it. And this way we can tap the signals between the system motherboard and the chip and there's a CPU and PPU both need one unfortunately unlike the RGB NES which only does video but since I'm reading the controllers and all that other stuff I really have to tap both of them. And then this also has a copy NES add-on circuit is underneath here. So if I turn this off, and then if I take these off, you can actually see that. So here's what it looks like underneath. There's uh, chips, and then these are the pins, and then the socket right here. So you can take this chip out and plug it into the socket, and it'll work like it always did, or you can plug this little doodad in its place. And the CPU and PPU both get one, of course, and this one's got a few different chips on it. So then here's our main board. And then what'll happen, so here's our main board. This one's not stuffed, but see there's these posts. And this actually just 
slides over those posts like that and neatly sits in the case. And this little uh, mold gate right here, this little circular thing, there's a cutout in the board for it. And where it says ABS, there's a cutout in the case for it. And then over here on the right side where this the screw boss is, there's yet another cutout in the board. And so you can see those cutouts. There's one there, there, and there. And then there's nothing on the bottom. This connector will not be stuffed. And there's nothing on the bottom, so it sits absolutely flat. And it just sits in there, slots in there like that. And then the HDMI connector will come out right here on the back of the system. And so when this board is in there, then the we just set our main board on top like that, and we're good to go. So the way this will actually function inside the system is like this. That your main board sits in there like that. And then these inner posers, they just lay like this. And then the main board goes on top, and then the inner posers wrap around and plug in like that. And you're done. And I'll use obviously these shorter cables so there's not all this length. So you know the cable will come around and it will sit neatly in there. It'll only be about that long. And even if they were too long, you can always just bend them up like that. But that's pretty much it. And the way this board will actually hold in here is I'm going to put some double stick tape here and here or or just foam some kind of foam tape on the board so that way the board will stay flat in here and you won't have to glue it in with hot melt. I hate hot melt. So this way you won't need any hot melt at all and you're good to go. The other thing you'll have to do is I've already done it on this system but the heat sink regulator right here this has to come off. This thing just gets really it sits back here like that. This thing gets just stupidly hot and it's really inefficient so especially with this mod this again gets even in if you use this mod and a power pack it gets so hot your cartridge just like cooks it comes out smoking hot so what I've done on this board now it's actually um, see I, this is still in the carrier I haven't broken it out yet but I've actually in the little tiny corner here less than a it's about a square centimeter is a 5 volt high efficiency switching power supply I've built into this unit. So and there's this pad here and that pad just connects to one lead of this 7805 and that'll get power from the, the power jack onto that pad and then the 5 volts that runs the system will actually come through these ribbon cables instead of coming out of that regulator. So you just need that one wire and everything will be hunky-dory if you do that. So, yep, that's what it's looking like. And oh yeah, on this other board, uh, you can't see it on this board, but one of the other ones I've completed, there is a mini USB jack. So this is the USB copy nest. So this board had the USB copy nest on it, and this other board does not, so. The only difference really is I just left this chip off in that connector. So that's what makes this a copy nest. So if you don't order the copy nest, those parts won't be on there. And then I've also added this, these five pads here. And this is to, to draw off the digital audio because someone thought they would want that. And I thought that was an okay idea. So if you really want the digital audio before it goes in the HDMI chip, you can just tap it right there and connect it to a, a DAC or if you want SP diff, you can do that. Whatever you want. It's 48 kilohertz standard audio with the LR clock, M clock, and serial data. So that's pretty much all it is. And that's that's all the new additions. So I got a Finish testing this hardware. Three of the three of the four I stuffed work. One of them doesn't, and I don't know why. So, and the USB parts having a slight problem, but I know how to fix that. That'll be really easy. I just got to add a resistor, and that'll fix it. And then finish up the code and send some out for testing. And I think the project is done. So that's how it's all going to fit in the box. So the next part, I'm going to be showing off the reflow oven that I've used to create the boards. And then I will uh, do the assembly video last, and that'll be pretty much it. And this time, 
I'll play some more NSFs that I like over top of the over top of the time lapse, and I will go back to the last video, and I'll actually post a track list. Cause I know a bunch of people actually wanted to know what the songs were, which I thought was kind of interesting. I was curious to see how many songs that people would get, and it looks like a couple of them trip people up. So I will put a list in the description here, and when you see this video, and you check the update number seven, you'll be able to see that list. And so. I will keep the tracks this time a mystery and you'll just have to guess again and probably on the next update video I will put a list of what the tracks were. Well I thought I'd do a little video about the toaster oven reflow machine here that I've made. It's pretty simple, it's just a regular old toaster oven but there's been some slight modifications. Inside I have this tube I've added, it's a piece of stainless steel tube. And there's two thermocouples in here. They're K-type thermocouples. I bought these from Omega. And when the board sits in there, like this, those thermocouples give you a fairly accurate temperature of what's going on right where the board is, which is where your soldering is going to occur. And then on the elements, I have these this aluminum foil. And the reason this foil is on here is because this protects your circuit board from the direct infrared from the heating element. There's two elements at the top, two at the bottom, and this this aluminum foil prevents the direct infrared you know, heat from these elements from directly hitting your board. It's kind of like a shield, and I've noticed the top one that needs replacing. It's getting holes in it from the flux, but that's okay. Aluminum foil, it's, at least it's cheap and easy to put on. So if you don't have these on here, what can happen? Your board can scorch because the direct IR will actually heat the board differently and depending on what's on your board here like the black parts like the chips will get more heat because they're darker and the lighter things like these pads won't get as much heat because they reflect it so when you uh, put these covers on here it helps quite a bit and also on the heat department when I had this closed you'll see uh, when I'm using this oven, I was putting tape around these edges, and that's to keep the air from leaking out the top, the hot air. Eventually, I will put a seal around here to prevent that, but actually, it'll go right here. I haven't done that yet. And so, the, these oven controls don't do anything anymore. I mean, the, the thermostat's still in there. You can hear it, but it doesn't do anything. And then this this neon, blue neon bulb flashes every time the heater is on, this turns on also. And then the timer actually still works, but I have it on stay on, so if I turn it like, like that, it turns off. And then, so what I did, I put these plastic boxes on the side, they're just attached to this metal cover here. This metal cover comes off and then these boxes are screwed to it. And over on the side is the control system here. So this is a Omega control. They didn't make it, they just private label it. But what this does, this is called a heat slash soak controller. And I have a program inside here that I did that causes the temperature to ramp up. The process variable is actually the temperature in Celsius inside the oven right now. Since I just finished a reflow cycle, it's reading 38. So if I put my finger on there, it'll, it'll drop. And then this is the set value is the value that the oven is trying to attain so when I start a cycle this will slowly count up and then as it counts up the heater here will come on so if I actually start a cycle you hold this run button and it says run and what it'll do this is the temperature that the oven is supposed to be inside and then this is will sh this will start flashing once this approaches this value here, it'll start flashing and turn the heater on, so the inside temperature should start rising when that happens. And at the beginning, the ramp is fairly slow. It's um, a degree every, I think, two or three seconds. And then once it reaches, I think, 50 degrees, the temperature ramp will speed up, and then when it reaches 190 degrees, the temperature ramp will speed up yet again. So if you look at the reflow profile of like a solder paste, that's what this, that's what I'm trying to follow. And I mean, this is kind of ghetto, but at least it starts work, at least it works. So once this approaches this, so now this will start flashing. Yep, and that's the heater turning on and off right now. So now this will start getting warmer, and as the temperature differential gets bigger, 
the heater will stay on longer and longer. So now that the temperature differential is, uh, what, four degrees, five degrees, this is now on solid. And once it reaches the temperature, since this heater will overrun, once it starts getting close, this, this uh, heater will turn off and it'll start um, cycling it on and off so it has yes yeah, right now it starts cycling because it says oh well if I keep the heater on it's going to overshoot and it'll get too hot in there too soon so now the heater's not even on and, and the temperature is just coasting and see it's approaching and following it fairly closely now so now it'll now that the temperature's still coasting but the coasting is going to slow down and it will realize that and see it overshot a little bit, but that's fine. It's only two or, two or three degrees, so I really don't care too much. And so that's how it works. I won't run the whole cycle. When, during the time lapse, you'll see me run the cycle four times, but this is how it works. Once the cycle ends, this fan here will turn on, and when this fan turns on, it blows air inside the oven, and then the air actually comes out right here that I've cut the uh, metal work away right in there. It's kind of hard to see, but there's a, you can see the insulation I've put in here. So I've actually insulated this box and you can see the insulation is right there and there's insulation along the top up here. And there's insulation on this side and on this side also. The back is not insulated. It's just that sheet metal. And that's basically how it works. And also on the left side, there's a, there's a thermocouple connector here. And so this allows me to plug this thermocouple into my uh, temperature readout, readout, and you'll see me do that during the reflow, and I'll have it sitting to the side there, and you can actually watch it. And then this is the temperature on the secondary thermocouple. And I mean, I could theoretically put yet more thermocouples in here, but the two seems to be pretty good, and they're both, they're both right here. Here's the side of the oven right here. There's a fan right here. And what this fan does is this fan blows air inside the chamber over on this side here where the control guts are. And this way, it keeps my controller here cool. And there's a solid state relay inside the oven which turns the elements on and off. And then this controller drives that. And then there's a little circuit board over here. And what the circuit board does, this controls the fan speeds. There's two PWM generators on this board. So in a relay, so when this controller is just sitting idle, this fan turns. You can control the speed with these two pots. One of these pots, the other pot controls the speed of that cool down fan. And then there's just a transformer in the bottom, and I mean, that's pretty much it. And then the second thermocouple obviously connects in this controller box. On the back, there's really not a lot to see. The solid state relay is behind this aluminum plate, and this is just a backer because this sheet metal is really thin, so that solid state relay is just screwed into this um, into this aluminum plate on standoffs on the other side and you can see the insulation here some of the insulation there and there's the thermocouple wire and I used uh, Teflon coated wire to connect that fan over there that way it's not going to melt and then I just have some little wires here that hold it in place and that's pretty much it and these screws I just don't have them in there's no need there it's actually held in at the bottom and the back's pretty much unmodified other than that and here's the extremely short cord. I mean, this is pretty much, that's the whole cord right there. It's like, I don't know, a foot long. And they do this probably because this fat extension cord, or this fat wire is probably really expensive. So they want to make it as short as possible, obviously, to save money. But so far, this oven's been working quite well. And I think I paid about, a cost me about, two hundred dollars to build it. There's somebody on the internet that makes a, makes a really nice reflow oven and it cost about four hundred and fifty dollars and then he bumped the price up to fifteen hundred dollars and I cribbed some of the ideas for this oven off of his um, design so obviously he had shields on the elements so I put shields on mine because of that and there's even a dead fly in the oven. That dead fly's been in there the last uh, five cycles. I don't know why the fly has not burned up, but it hasn't. So that's pretty much an overview of the reflow oven that I used. So now we'll look at the boards that I reflowed on it. 
So here's the fruits of a couple hours worth of labor. Four nice and stuffed version two boards. I've only stuffed the copy nest USB portion on two of them and these interposers on two because these two boards are going to have a slight a different interposer for different for different systems and I made a separate interposer for this that the only difference is it flips these connectors around so if your system needs the interposers with the connectors on the other side of the board it's not a problem here's the other set of interposers and it's the same as this interposer except these connectors are flipped around, so these are actually like this. If the in, in this way the CPU PPU markings are in the same place, but the difference is, of course, the connectors are flipped. So this one the connectors come out the bottom, and this one they come out the top. But otherwise they're pinned out exactly the same. And, oh, that sounds like it's raining. Anyways, OSH stencils where I got these from but they give you this nice little credit card doodad which you can use as a solder paste spreader so when you just take it go to an angle and press fairly hard like this one nice paint solder paste on everything like that Yummy. Last time I did this I had pasting problems, so this time I'm being a bit more careful. And hopefully this will work. So there now it's been pasted. And I guess I can zoom in on that. Kind of hard to see. Let's see that glare of that light. So then once that's done, the next step of course is to undo it. So I'm going to just undo this piece of tape and gently peel it off. Pull the board out. And I don't know if you can see it, but the paste is now on those pads fairly cleanly, so I'm happy with it. That's a lot better than last time. So I'm going to give that a try. I'll set this aside. I'm just going to make several boards. So I'll do another one here. And carefully paste again. I have to press pretty hard to do this. There, like that. And I'll go over a slightly different angle here. There. Off, gently lift it. And as you can see, it's pasted fairly well. There's a bit of smudging, but it's better to have too much paste than not enough. Because if you don't have enough paste, then things won't stick and oh, it's a mess. I made one proto already and it didn't get enough paste and it was a big mess trying to straighten it out so I'm going with a little extra this time so it looks like it's important to have nice even pressure on this card like that I'm going to do four boards today. That should be enough protos. So there's board number three. Then 
one more. Like that. Do it again. go so that should be it a bit thick but that like I said that's okay I can always take it off so take these extra boards out of the way so now I got a mess I got a clean my stencil here, so I think I'm just going to put a piece of paper towel under it, get some alcohol. Actually, first I'm going to get rid of this uh, extra paste here, because this is perfectly good paste. It's reusable, like that. So I keep this paste in the refrigerator, and before I use it, I keep it and or I set it out and let it sit at room temperature for a while, and that will make sure that all the that it warms up. I'm gonna just go over the stencil again, just to get the bulk of the excess off here. There, put the paste away. So now the next step is to clean our stencil. So some alcohol and then just rub it with some paper towel and that'll get all the remainder off. So I've reused this stencil now. This will be the second use of it and after I cleaned it it was just fine. You can see the uh, paste that's kind of gone through it. And this is just a shelf. You can buy at Lowe's or any other home supply store. I think they're just a couple bucks. So there's a stencil. I'll clean it up a bit more, but I wanted to get these board doodads out of the way first. No endorsement for OSH stencils, but they seem to be quite decent and they're cheap. So this stencil was only about $15. And the stainless ones I've been using were much more expensive than that. And since this is just prototype use, that's fine. There. So those board holders are out of the way. I'll clean it up a bit. Just so it's nice next time. And to finish cleaning the stencil, I'll put it on some flat stuff. Put the alcohol on it again. And just to make sure that all those little holes in there are cleaned out, I'll use some canned air. This stuff. Those holes are extremely small. Some of them are. So, gotta get them cleaned out. And then I'll clean it one more time on this side. Make sure. Like that. There. Now the stencil is all nice and clean again, and I can use it a third time if I have to. Hopefully, I won't, but in case I do, it's all nice and ready to go again. 
hopefully you can see that the solder paste is pretty much on those pads and I don't know if the camera will pick it up, but when I look through it myself, you can see the little, the little, the solder is actually little tiny balls that are suspended in like a flux, and that's what the paste is. Now that the pasting is done, the assembly part can start. So what I'm going to do, I will do a time lapse of the assembly. So the goal is going to be place all of these parts on those boards. To help with assembly, I have this doodad here. This is a little, it's basically what amounts to an aquarium pump that runs backwards, so it, it has this hand piece here, and there's a little hole, and what you're supposed to do is you put your finger over this hole to pick something up, and then you take your finger away, and the vacuum breaks, and it falls off. So I've taped that hole up because you don't really need it, and you can control the vacuum here, and so what this does is takes little syringe tips, and fortunately on eBay, these are very cheap. I got this bag of I don't know how much, how many. I think there's ten of each kind in there, and there's like at least eight kinds. And I paid a whopping like three dollars. And basically, the way it works is it's just an extremely fine needle, and you put it on the end here like this, and then you can just pick the parts up, and they'll stick to the end of this by a vacuum. And then when I touch them into that paste the paste will grab onto the part and it will come off this needle and that's pretty much all there is to it. But after a while sometimes the solder paste will get caught inside this needle so to fix that I have a syringe here and I just fill this with some alcohol and then I just put the to send down here and squeeze it and yeah these are needles but these are not sharp there's no point to it so these are just hollow. So here's a bigger one. You can see that I believe in there. It's just a hollow needle and I'll change, be changing the needle size here depending on what I'm picking up and for the for the FPGAs which are really big I got this little tiny rubber suction cup that I'll be using so I can just go doot 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 and pick the chips up and it won't, hopefully won't fall off. And that's basically what I'll be doing. I'll be taking parts out of many, many bags, putting them onto this little pickup device and depositing them on these circuit boards. So this will be moved over here out of the way. Being very careful not to touch that solder paste. And we're ready to go of course got the ever-present parts list which will tell me where all the parts go stick that over here and that's it ready to assemble so I will put the camera into time-lapse mode and get with it